The Healer, The Healing Work of Mary Baker Eddy Compiled and Arranged by David Keeston Part 5, Fourth Continuation Number 236 Mrs. Eddy was well aware of the constant suggestions of animal magnetism, the devil, or evil, which most of her students accepted unwittingly. But the following incident was an eye-opener for Calvin C. Hill. One day, when I was with Mrs. Eddy, she rang for her personal maid, and requested that she bring some article to her. The maid returned, bringing something totally different from what Mrs. Eddy had asked for. Mrs. Eddy looked at her earnestly and said, Dear, that isn't what I told you to bring, naming the article, and I told you where to find it. Now please get it. Turning to me, Mrs. Eddy remarked, as I recall her words, That is what animal magnetism does to the members of my household, and they will say, Mother sometimes forgets. Shortly after I left her, I met this same maid in the hall, and she said to me, Mother sometimes forgets what she asks for. From Romans They which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Number 237 One day, when the message for 1901 was about half finished, Clara Shannon felt the insidious wickedness that was striking at Mrs. Eddy's life, and was doing her utmost to counteract it. Miss Shannon was keeping her watch, the term used to describe the time assigned for mental workers to reduce error, evil, to nothing, and to exalt and prove the complete control, authority, and reign of Almighty God in another room. And Calvin Fry and Joseph Mann were with Mother, who was having a struggle, as Miss Shannon knew. She could hear the two men talking with Mother, and Miss Shannon was praying to God, sometimes on her knees, for life and strength, truth and love to be manifest there. For Miss Shannon felt something awful was approaching mentally. Finally, the sound of the men's voices ceased. Miss Shannon said she heard that silence. It was the most awful sound she had ever heard. She went into Mother's room, and there lay Calvin Fry and Joseph Mann stretched on the floor, flat on their faces. Then she looked at Mother. Her head had dropped, her jaw dropped, and every sign of death. Miss Shannon shouted truth at her, shook her, called her, quoted the book Science and Health, reminded her that Mother had written this book. Finally, consciousness began to return, and Miss Shannon told her to stand on her feet, and putting her hands under Mother's armpits, held her up, a dead weight. Finally, and suddenly, Mother laughed. Miss Shannon looked up and gave thanks when she heard this, and asked what the laugh meant. Mother said, Your face! If you could see your face, you would laugh too. Mrs. Eddy picked up her pad of paper and continued her writing as if nothing had happened, which was not as easy for Clara Shannon to do.
She returned to her room across the hall, but left the door ajar and kept looking in on Mother quietly. After two or three times, Mrs. Eddy rebuked her, saying sharply, Go and handle your fear. You are afraid I shall have another attack. Go and handle your own fear. In her earnest intensiveness, Miss Shannon had become unconscious of the unconscious men on the floor and knew not when they recovered and departed. When the message was completed, Mrs. Eddy said to Miss Shannon, Oh, what a lot of love it took to do that! The mesmerists did not want the world to have that message, but love meant it to be given. She also told Clara that the message for 1901 was Christian science in a nutshell. From Jeremiah Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved for thou art my praise. Number 238 Mother told me that one day she was called to help a family where several members were ill, and she had to remain for some days. Before going to them, she left a pot containing a plant with a beautiful flower on the window sill of her sitting room. On returning home, when she went into the room, there was the plant, all withered, and the earth cracked. The sun had been pouring in through the glass of the closed window and had dried up the earth. A friend who was with her saw it. She then went to the next room to open windows, and in a short time she heard the friend exclaim. When she went to see the reason for this exclamation, she found the plant had revived without being watered, and the leaves and flower were just as beautiful as when she had left them. This was the result of the truth she had been realizing, the truth that God and all of God's ideas reflect infinite life, never subject to mortal law, decay, or death. Mrs. Eddy made the divine law of the kingdom of heaven practical in her continual radiating of God's love. From Revelation Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Number 239 I must not forget the goldfish in the fountain basin. There was a large number of them. The dogs from the street used to come and drink water from the basin to quench their thirst in the severe heat, and they would snap at the little goldfish. Our leader designed a cover for the basin of the fountain, which was of copper wire, with diamond-shaped holes through which the dogs could reach the water to drink, but the holes were not big enough to let them reach the goldfish. The food for the goldfish sent from Boston periodically in small boxes looked like oblong sheets of white blotting paper or rice paper, about six inches wide. Number 240 
Daily, when Mother reached home after her drive, my duty was to have the little box of food ready for her. She would take a few sheets, and we would go to the fountain together, and she would break them in pieces and feed the fish, which, on hearing her voice, would swim to the top of the water with wide-open mouths. One day, when she put her hand in the water, her diamond marquee ring, which was on the underside of her finger, sparkled as the sun shone on it, and the fish were frightened and darted away. She did not move her hand, but called out, Come, little fish, come to mother. You are not afraid. And they all returned and swam in and out between her fingers, regardless of the sparkling ring. Another day, when I handed her the food, she said, You stay here. Don't come with me. I will go on tiptoe, very quietly, and see if they will feel my thought and come for the food. She walked over the grass to the fountain very quietly and did not speak. Immediately the fish rose to the surface. Then she beckoned me to join her, signing to me not to speak, and I saw the fish waiting for their food, which she gave them. Number 240 Mrs. Laura E. Sargent told the following story to the class she taught in the Metaphysical College, 1913. Mrs. Eddy, in one of her homes, had two canaries, named Benny and May. One day someone moved the chair against one of the birds, May, which was on the floor and broke its leg so that it was held together just by a piece of skin. The bird was put back in its cage, and shortly afterwards a visitor came in. The other bird, Benny, kept flying between the cage and the visitor, and chattering to attract her attention. And when she asked our leader what was the matter with the bird, Mrs. Eddy told her to look in the cage. She did so and exclaimed, Why, this bird's leg is broken. Our leader asked her to come back in three days. And when the lady returned three days later, she found the bird's leg was perfectly healed and little May was hopping about on her perch. When Mrs. Eddy insisted on visiting a circus, she stood in front of the lion's cage. As she did so, the lion began to roar and run about the cage. She looked right at it until it quieted down. Then she said, That is what I came for. Number 241 Nemi Robertson wrote a letter to Mrs. Eddy at a time when she was exercised in her mind about a patient who showed great resentment toward Mrs. Eddy. Although she had not actually mentioned the patient, the reply from Mrs. Eddy contained the advice, Turn your patient's thought to God, and let love show me to him just as I really am. The patient was healed. Marie Chalmers Ford related this personal encounter with Mary Baker Eddy's healing love when she wrote Mrs. Eddy some time later. In fact, Mrs. Eddy wrote on the envelope containing this letter, Case of My Healing. As the time for my departure from my brothers drew near, 
I became so ill that I could scarcely walk without great suffering, and it seemed as though I would not be able to go alone, if at all. All the time I was holding to this one sentence in Science and Health, page 494, Divine love always has met and always will meet every human need. And I found myself on the train for Concord. When I reached there, I went directly to Christian Science Hall, a combination church and reading room, and was told that in a short time your carriage would pass. I sat down in one of the windows to read, but my suffering was still so intense that I could scarcely see the pages. Very soon someone came to me quietly and said that your carriage was coming. Of course, I expected you only to drive past, but instead you drove up and stopped almost directly in front of where I sat in the open window. Someone from the rooms went out to your carriage, and you talked with them several minutes. Many times during those few minutes, you glanced up at the window where I sat and looked straight into my eyes. You drove away, and I arose from my chair perfectly healed. There was not the slightest sense or any pain of suffering left, and I had not been free from pain night or day for almost a week. Number 242 one day, a beautifully dressed student called on Mrs. Eddy, expecting her to pour out a spiritual thought to her. Instead, Mrs. Eddy started talking on her own plane of thought, commenting on her fine clothing and remarking, What a beautiful hat you have on! And that practically ended the conversation. This story was related to the author as an interesting picture of just how God demands our unconditional trust and faith. A woman needed help. Her resources had been totally depleted. She was being evicted from her home. It was at this point she went to our leader for help and advice. After a brief interview with Mrs. Eddy, the woman turned to go, but Mrs. Eddy held out her hand with upturned palm. The woman asked, What are you doing? Mrs. Eddy replied in substance, Have you benefited from what I have said? Thereupon the woman gave Mrs. Eddy her last ten cents that was to be used to take her home so she could gather up her possessions. Shortly after this woman left Mrs. Eddy's home and was walking down the street, a man yelled to her from across the street, Mrs. Mrs. She turned and the man ran up to her saying, I have been trying to track you down from your previous home. I have just now finally caught up to you to give you this. From his pocket, he took a check for the woman for about $10,000, equivalent to about $3 million today. A settlement of the estate of a relative recently passed on. From Luke And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, Of a truth I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. 
for all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God. But she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. From Matthew But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The following testimony, preserved in the Christian Saint Sentinel, is yet another testament to Mrs. Eddy's remarkable ability to effect healing whatever the situation, whether lecturing or on a carriage ride. I awoke on the morning of that day with a sense of suffering so severe that it was a great effort to get up. I could eat no breakfast, and after working, praying, an hour, was relieved, but by no means free. Ordinarily, I should have thought it the better part of wisdom to remain quiet, but so great was the desire to be present at the meeting and hear, Mrs. Eddy, that I should hear the needed word of healing and strength from her lips. Nor was I disappointed. While Mrs. Eddy was speaking, the pain lessened, and then I forgot it completely until later, during the services, I realized that all sense of discord had vanished. Not only this, but for many months afterwards, I was better and stronger, did better healing work for my patients, and experienced an unusual degree of spiritual and mental freedom. Number 243 A student once said to Mrs. Eddy that since coming into Christian science she had lost fear to such an extent that she did not have the slightest fear of walking down Columbus Avenue alone at eleven o'clock at night. Mrs. Eddy replied, Do not tempt the Lord your God. Number 244 Mr. and Mrs. Riley were asked to pay a call on Mrs. Eddy shortly after they had lost both a son and another dear one. Since Mrs. Eddy was having much to meet in the field at the time, they were determined not to let their own grief appear in the interview, and sought to clear their thoughts of the grief entirely. When they went to see her, so far as they knew, they had eliminated this from their thoughts. But Mrs. Eddy was keen to read thought and in the midst of the conversation said, Now, in regard to death, suppose you were sitting in this chair, and I was sitting in that one conversing with you, and suddenly an archer should shoot an arrow into your heart from that window. You would experience a sudden shock, a commotion within, nothing more. I would try to continue our conversation, but I, believing the arrow had killed you, could no longer converse with you. So you would arise from your chair, leaving no body in the chair, and go among those you could converse with, while I would have to bury my belief of you, which was still in the chair." she declared that death was just like that. Needless to say, this insight provided by Mrs. Eddy was of great help to the Rileys in completely removing any lingering sense of grief they may have had for their loved ones. Number 245 one time there was a state fair at the back of Pleasant View, Mrs. Eddy's home, and there was a man, Oscar Noren, 
who dived from a high place into some shallow water. Mrs. Eddy, with Judge and Mrs. Ewing in the carriage, drove down to see him dive, and he came up to Pleasant View afterwards to speak to her, and she took him into the drawing room and began to talk to him about hearing voices when a child, and Miss Shannon wondered why she did this. Then Mrs. Eddy went on to speak about fear and said, You are able to dive because you have overcome fear. He said, yes, he had no fear whatever. He had practiced for a long time, taking higher and a higher dive, till he could do it without fear. Then Mrs. Eddy said, Use that overcoming of fear on your eyes. The man had dark glasses on and said, Well, I damaged one eye so that the eyeball had to be taken out. And that is why I wear these glasses. Because the eye is unpleasant to look at. The cabman who took this man to the station told afterwards that when the man got to the station, he took off his glasses and his eye was completely restored, so that both eyes were the same. I heard from another source that Mrs. Eddy once told her class that she had healed a man of blindness whose eyeballs were gone, and had restored his sight at the same time. Someone in the class asked, why, if sight was mental, she needed to restore his eyeballs. And she pointed out that if he had gone around telling people he could see things when he did not have any eyes to see with, they would have thought he was crazy and would have shut him up. From John Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God, and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. At another time, Mrs. Eddy made the comment that God restores that standard of perfection that mortal mind calls for, and that such things must be humanly manifested. In August 1902, Mrs. Eddy wrote to a student, I want you to give most of your time to healing. This department of Christian science is the one in which no student has equaled me. It is the one to which every student should aspire to more than any other. Number 246 I would like to read an excerpt given to me in the very early days by Mr. James Neal, the beloved student and friend of our leader. I have given this before, but I find it so valuable that I cannot resist sharing with you our leader's own interpretation of Christmas morn in healing a patient. Thou gentle beam of living love and deathless life, truth infinite is you as God sees you as you see yourself. Still, I quote our leader, I have taken this hymn and raised a patient who was at the point of passing on in the hospital. I held her as a gentle beam of what? Living love. As far above all the strife, all the striving, as far above the conditions that brought her there, 
or cruel creed, the doctor's verdict. So far above all cruel edicts, creeds of mortal belief, or earth-born taint, so far above any taint of inheritance. Fill us, fill her, today, right now, with all thou art. With what? With living love and deathless life, truth infinite. Thou all of her, thou all of me, fill us, be thou our all of life always. Number 247. When Professor Herman S. Herring became interested in Christian science, he read in Science and Health, page 118, line 23, where Mrs. Eddy said, Yeast changes the chemical properties of meal. He said it was too bad that such an intelligent woman as Mrs. Eddy should make such a mistake. Not long afterwards, another man at the same college came to him and told him that he had just made the discovery that yeast changes the chemical properties of meal. Later, Professor Herring met Mrs. Eddy and asked her how she knew that yeast changes the chemical properties of meal when it had not been discovered. She said that she did not know it, that she just wrote down what God told her. From Job There is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Number 248. The following is an inspiring account from Elizabeth Earl Jones, C.S.B., a teacher of Mrs. Eddy's day. As the carriage came alongside Mrs. Hazard and Miss Jones, our leader seemed to feel her rather than see her, for she was looking, as it were, into the far depths of infinity and eternity, with, oh, such a solemn, intent expression in her large, serious eyes. I had never seen so profoundly serious an expression on any face before. It was half forward, half up look, as if our dear leader was listening to and communing with things so far above and beyond mortal ken that it is impossible to describe. I remember thinking at the time what a sin it was to interrupt such sacred communion, and I never did it again. Her eyes looked black and luminous, she wore a purple velvet dress and ermine cape, a small purple and ermine bonnet with a black velvet band under her chin. Her hair was soft, curly, and snowy white. She was a rarely beautiful, exquisitely refined, yet forceful woman. She sat erect in her carriage like a lady of the old school, there was a gentle elegance about her and great spirituality. She seemed centuries above even the best of humanity today. I do not know how Mrs. Eddy looked at the others, but when she seemed to swoop down from heaven to greet me, she seemed to look clean through me with a sweetly searching, penetrating look like a great searchlight turned full upon me. I felt glad, however, to be searched by such wonderful love. Number 249. 
I did not know there was such love in all the world. It warmed me through and through, and lifted me high above the plane of human consciousness. I had never been on that plane before, and have never been entirely on the old plane since. The crushing load just melted into nothingness, and I felt so happy and free and so strongly uplifted. For days I seemed to walk on air. I cannot describe the uplift and exhilaration of that divine love which dear Mrs. Eddy radiated. Everyone and everything I saw seemed to be baptized in that divine love. I can imagine from this experience what it must have been to come into the presence of Jesus. There is nothing else like it. It is an experience one can never forget.